Hello viewers, today's guest will be familiar to many of you. He is well known for advocating and to a large extent pioneering what's known as street epistemology or SE. Rather than debating street preachers, street epistemologists pursue a dialectic Socratic method and Anthony, I am delighted that you could come on the channel and educate me and my viewers on how we can better do just that. Hey Lloyd, it's really nice to be here with you. I, I've seen your name many, many times over the years. <laughs> and it's, it's nice to be able to sit down and chat with you. Occasionally in a good way, I hope. So... <laughs> Almost always in a good in a good way. Maybe it's just the it's this the bubble that I'm in or the circles that I travel in. But yes. no, when your name comes up, it's it's always favorable. It seems. But the propaganda always. is working. Then I'm delighted to hear that. So <laughs> um, thanks for having me on your show. Seriously, I'm really I'm excited about this and looking forward to it. Oh, it's an honor. So I guess we need to start by asking uh, what first got you started or interested in street epistemology. Yeah, well, it all really started when I read Bogosian's book called A Manual for Creating Atheists, where he, he outlines this idea of street epistemology, where you engage in a civil conversation. You're not actually arguing and presenting facts and, and ridiculing people, but you're listening and you're questioning what they believe, why, and the method that they use, the how. And... I was looking to have I was looking to you know to have a better more fruitful conversation with frankly the loved ones in my life who believed this stuff because I was arguing with them and I was debating with them and I was running into walls left and right it wasn't fruitful I was it seemingly making things worse when I was debating with them and presenting them with facts to show how mistaken they were or this type of thing so so I was at I was ready for this type of book and I started going out and practicing street epistemology on the street which you don't have to be on the street doing it hopefully you, many you and I think you get that and probably many of your followers understand that but a lot of people get get hung up on that like this seems like you're 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 just as bad as the guy on the corner yelling about Jesus or or some god um and I can understand why people might think that because many of the examples that are out there today are of people initiating talks on the street. But this is a great approach for having talks with the loved ones in your life, your mom, your dad. It doesn't have to be with strangers and you don't have to film them. And the approach does seem to be quite effective in helping a person think about their belief formation process and if they used a reliable method. And that's what I found so appealing to me. Uh, if, if you'll forgive the question, I don't want to pry too much, but you mentioned that you wanted to reach out to loved ones. Um, did, do you have religion in your background at all, or is it simply a case of having family members who were religious? I was raised in a religious household. I was raised in a Catholic family, uh, and slowly over the years, I think they migrated more to just general Christianity. Uh, I, 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 was, I was immersed in it. Everywhere I went, I, I grew up in the Midwest, and, and it was my family, my friends, everyone believed, or at least purported to believe. But at a young age, I questioned, I doubted, I didn't think that it was real. I, th I thought it was made up, and I told my parents at a young age, I said, I think this is kind of made up like Santa. Are, are all the parents just pretending on this? And they were horrified that I would even ask the question, and they assured me, no, Anthony, like this is real. Yes, Santa's made up, but no, the Scott thing is real. And I just, it just never stuck with me. Even, even after they sat me down with a priest and a nun and they tried to explain how true this was that I just, I, I said, okay, I believe now after they asked me if I did mainly because it seemed important to them. And I thought, well, I don't believe this, but they all seem, think it's important and well, maybe it's true. And I don't know. I just moved on to whatever, something else, watching the bulls game or something or the bears. So uh, <laughs> um, but I was always skeptical and I never really, it never really caught on. And then, you know, I got married, I started having kids and then they start asking, you know, daddy, Johnny at school is telling me that this is true or he wants to know what church I go to and I don't know what to tell him. Then you start thinking, okay, uh, you know, what, 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 what's my position on this claim? 
And what do I want my kids being taught? So that's when things started shifting and I started getting more interested in, in the atheist community, identifying as an atheist for one, that took a little while to really kind of get comfortable with that, that label. And then right around that time I discovered Bogosian's book. So it was kind of like the perfect, even though there were some initial missteps and I was having bad conversations with the loved ones because I was, I was angry. I was, I was arguing with, with the loved ones in my life, like about this stuff. But the book came along, and it's it, like I said it's, before, it's changed me. So that's that's kind of my journey in a nutshell. I was always skeptical. I, I guess I've never really believed it, but I understand how important this belief is to people. Good. Well, I was going to ask you. Um, I, I I guess if I was in your position, I would be slightly wishing is probably the wrong word, but it probably would have put you at an advantage to know what it's like to actually be a believer. And it sounds like you bypassed, for various reasons, that stage. So do, do you feel as though you, you can, to some extent at least, relate to the absolute belief that people have in, 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 in what their religion is? I think so, yes. So I, I've met a lot of people who, because I'm, I, I'm in the atheist community, I talked to a lot of people, and I encounter a lot of atheists who never believed. And honestly, when I look back at it, even though I was skeptical, but I was raised in a, in a believing household and culture. And in hindsight, I'm glad that that happened because I do think that I can better understand the mentality of a believer. And I, it, maybe it's a little bit easier for me to even have some compassion for the believers that are out there. I can understand. And, and maybe I would still be a believer if I if I hadn't stumbled across a book or, or watched a particular program when I was four or had some encounter on the playground that may have shaped the way, th who knows? I mean, I, I very well could still be a believer. So that is a humbling thing. And I think helps, it, it certainly has helped me better understand the believer's mindset. And that might be, that might be one of the reasons why I think I'm fairly good at SE because I think being able to set aside your your position, your biases, the the, the harm, the hard, the hard feelings that you may have towards believers. It's very important to set that aside when you want to try to use an approach like street epistemology, because if you if you can be mature enough to set aside your anger and your biases, you can ask some pretty awesome questions to really challenge a person's belief formation process. So, um. It's been it's been good. It, honestly, like I don't really I, I wasn't abused as a kid. I'm not angry at God. Uh, nothing tragic happened to me to get rid of this belief. I just never never really never really took. But I I have an appreciation for the people who do believe. If that makes any sense, I yeah. can understand where they're coming from, and it's easier for me to have some sympathy for them. Uh, maybe because I was, and still am, surrounded by loved ones who still believe. Well, it's really refreshing to hear that because, quite frankly, um, you do encounter uh, atheists who can be perhaps quite sneering, quite, perhaps quite patronising. They look down on believers as stupid or ignorant or what have you. And it's really nice to see you and others. I'm thinking of the likes of Matt Dillahunty. I'm thinking of the likes of Alex O'Connor and Genetically Modified Skeptic. There seems to be like a compassionate um, awakening almost going on. And it's really nice to see. I think street epistemology dovetails perfectly with that because it is a more, um, a, a kinder approach, I believe. I, I agree that street epistemology is kinder. However, I, I think I could make an argument that even an aggressive approach where you're being direct and blunt and you're presenting people with facts and you might be cutting them off because they're about to launch into another silly argument and you cut them off before they can make that point so you can you can show them how wrong they are and thousands might be watching that for example that approach still has its place and I still even think comes from a place of compassion even though it may not seem like it on the surface Matt Dillahunty Aaron Ra genetically modified skeptic. Well, his style is a little bit more, more of a softer, more gentler approach from at least from what I've seen. 
But these varying styles, I think these people spend a lot of time having these conversations and modeling various behaviors for the audience that's out there. Why do we do that? Why do we spend so much time doing that? I think it's because we care. Whether we are taking the softer, gentler, more cordial, the longer, more circuitous route of street epistemology, or we're just making the the aggressive, in-your-face, straight shot, uh, a Matt Dillahunty or an Aaron Raw type of style. All of those people, and I've met these people, they are passionate about what they do, and they have different styles, admittedly. Mm. But I think they do it because they care. Mm. They see the harm that these beliefs are causing people, our communities, in our schools, everywhere. And they're getting off their asses and they're doing something. Yeah. So while I, while I wouldn't feel comfortable, it's just not in my nature, honestly. I, I could ratchet it up and I could be angry and I could present somebody with facts. Um, but it's it's just not kind of in my nature to do so. So I sort of – it was nice when I found Bogosian's work and the, the SE thing because I was like, this is like perfect for me as a person. But if I get ticked off, I might go more of a direct route. But I think regardless of the route that a person goes, when we have these conversations, I think at the heart of it, we're doing it because we care. Yeah. That's usually that's usually the case. There True. are a few people, I think. I think there are a few people that – they just love tearing somebody down because it feels good. Like they get enjoyment out of it. It's entertainment to some people to do it. But I'm 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 optimistic and I'm hopeful that that's a small percentage of the people that, that go that route. Yeah, that that's what I was going to say because I think what matters is is the your motives. Your motives are key, I believe, because if your motive is to entertain or your motive is to you know, get stuff off your chest or rant or pursue your own healing, that is going to impact on your productivity when it comes to this conversation. Because when you say aggressive, I am I associate that word with perhaps harassing people who are on the streets. You know, you, you do get videos of ex-witnesses act, actually confronting Jehovah's Witnesses who are doing cart witnessing and perhaps even knocking their literature off and shouting at them and forcing them to move along and that kind of thing. When you say aggressive, yeah. what you're meaning is being blunt and putting things to, to people bluntly, I think, is what you mean. I think I agree with you there. Yeah, yeah. when I say aggressive, I mean telling somebody that they're silly for believing that the earth is 6,000 years old. That's yeah. a ridiculous thing. How, how could you possibly believe that? That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm not equating that with turning over the, turning over the carts and spitting on people who are, who are preaching mm. or, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't even like it when I see videos of people who I've seen this lately where if there's a street preacher the, 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 the ground staff of the universities will come out with their weed whackers to, or their, 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 air, their leaf blowers to drown out these voices. I don't like that. I, I, I that's not really, I, I just, yeah, that, I think that crosses the line. Mm. So yeah, I'm not advocating for, for assault or anything well, like what that. What you're like, saying is it's okay to be blunt sometimes. Uh, and I would agree with you. And, and in fact, it was watching the bluntness of the the likes of Christopher Hitchens that really thought, mm -hmm. and I was I was thinking, gosh, that it, he's being so naughty, putting it like that. But I can't argue with it. He's right, you know. So you do sometimes <laughs> need that as a as a believer. Um, yeah, I I I wouldn't be here saying, listen, everybody, you need to start, you need to stop debating. And you need to stop providing evidence because it doesn't work. I'm not advocating that at all. What I'm, what, I'm, what I'm telling everybody here is why I've been promoting this method of street epistemology for five years is if it's not in your wheelhouse, if you're not comfortable being the aggressor, using my definition of that word, mm. aggressor, uh, or if, if it's not the right venue or in line with your goals and you recognize that you're not there to help the person – uh, that you're speaking to, but you're, you're, if you're, if you're looking to change, like, like, let's say, I don't know, like Hitchens appealing to an audience of 10,000 people, 
his aggressive style might actually be great, especially if it's being recorded and people are watching that. That in itself could change a lot of minds. It can help a lot of people reflect. But using that approach in a one-on-one talk with a loved one or even a stranger on the street, even that preacher in a one-on-one conversation, I would not advise you use that direct approach. Yeah. I think the, the street epistemology approach is so much better. Indeed. It, it's um, We say horses for courses in the, in the UK. I don't know whether you use that expression, but you, you adapt, don't you, to, to the different scenario. Um, you mentioned before a little bit, you've already described, I think, in our opening exchanges a little bit about what uh, street apology is. I'm just wondering whether you can explain a little bit more about what its goals are and just clarify how it differs from challenging someone. That's a great question. Okay, so so we, we kind of talked about running into the frustration of arguing with somebody providing a person with facts to show that they're mistaken. And SE is not that at all. In fact, when you are really well versed in a particular dogma or doctrine, you can possibly even end up shooting yourself in the foot quite a bit. So the less you know about a topic, the better I think it is when you engage in street epistemology, which is essentially asking questions, building some rapport, you know, setting the tone to be very friendly and to even, even get consent too. like, Hey, um, I'm really curious as to why you believe this thing, whether it's a God or a ghost or some other political stance or whatever. And can we, can we just have a, a conversation where I ask some questions to figure out what you believe, why you believe it, and more importantly, how you determined that those reasons are valid. And it's interesting how simply asking questions and being polite and, and reflecting the question back, or the answer back. So when if I ask a question and you give me an answer, I might say, okay, Lloyd, so if I understand what you're saying, the main reason why you think your God is real is because of this. Is that what you're saying? When, the, when a person hears their reasons come back to them, sometimes it could be a little shocking, like, did I really say it? I've even had people say that. Like, did I really, is that the, I know, it, I've even had people say, now that you're saying it back to me, I understand how silly it seems, but let me explain why it's not. You know, so you can, you can really get a sense of people hearing their own thoughts coming back to them and moving at a very respectful speed where you're not overwhelming your conversation partner. This is, this is about making a person feel comfortable modeling openness so that they will be as open and honest with you as possible. And you start peeling back. So rather than giving all these reasons why you're wrong, Lloyd, I want to hear all the reasons why you're correct. And the act of explaining that is extremely revealing. And what we find is with, with God beliefs in particular is that the epistemology or the way that a person is coming to know that that belief is true is not reliable. Usually what would it, so me saying, you believe that because of that, that's just ridiculous. But if a person discovers that on their own with a respectful partner, who's listening to them and not misrepresent, not misrep, and not misrep, gosh, darn it. <laughs> and not misrepresenting <laughs> and not misrepresenting what they're telling you. They're basically having a conversation with themselves on this deeply held belief. And it's a powerful thing to see it happen. And I've, I, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but I go out with the camera and I record these talks and then I upload them to my YouTube channel. I have several hundred on my channel where it's pretty evident that the person is thinking about this belief in a way that they may have never thought of before, especially if you were in their face and giving them evidence and that type of thing. So so this, this street epistemology approach is very largely based on the Socratic method. It is probably for people who, who are in, interested in your content, they're probably aware of the Socratic method. Uh, but we, I think we kind of take it a little bit of a step further. We we're incorporating some psychology in there. There's motivational interviewing. We try to get a sense of how sure a person is on a scale from zero to 100. So we have a little bit of a, a starting point and we can measure our progress. And I wouldn't be too terribly alarmed if I had a conversation with somebody and they said, you know what? At the end of this talk now, I think I'm even more confident in my position, whatever that view might be. The, the goal of SE isn't to just dismantle people's beliefs. It's to 
see if the belief that you're holding is true. Mm. And yeah. it's a dialectical to figure that out. And it's, it's wonderful. I love it. Um, and I, I can't, I really can't see ever wanting to, to go back to debating or, or using counter apologetics. Honestly, when I watch it, I, I get like, I've seen videos of, of Jehovah's witnesses getting demolished by very rude people. And I feel sorry for the Jehovah's witness. And I think it makes atheists look terrible when mm-hmm. we do that. Mm-hmm. Now, there may be JWs who are watching that exchange and thinking, oh, gosh, that even though that guy was a jackass, he really crushed that guy. And that's the same reason why I think Jehovah's God. But the person who was on the other end of that is not going to change. Probably he'll, he'll, he or she will probably be more resolute in what they believe. Mm-hmm. And, and w- when we have conversations with people, typically – we don't go the apologetic route. Oh, I'm sorry. We typically do go the apologetic route. Um, but listen, if if you, if, if you and your viewers, um, you know, find this interesting and start learning about it, I think it will fundamentally change the conversations that you have. I really do for the better. Well, definitely. Um, I've, I've, I don't know whether you're familiar, but, um, I've dabbled in it a little bit myself. I'm fairly limited in how much street epistemology I can do because I live in a non-English speaking country and, uh, I don't speak the local language all that well, but I did try some street epistemology in my trip to the United States last year. I had a chat with a Jehovah's witness who happened to be preaching in Disneyland of all places. Why they let witnesses in there? I have no idea. Um, mm. but it was it was i mean i i didn't go into it thinking i'm going to do street epistemology it was just that the and i was kind of familiar with it but the approach that i took just organically happened to be more or less what you've described i didn't really want to debate i didn't want to challenge i just wanted to hear them say in their own words what their beliefs are because having been a jehovah's witness i know how ridiculous the beliefs are I want to hear them Mm -hmm. say it. Uh, And what ensued was a a very interesting, or for me at least, it was a very interesting conversation. Um, I know you've had numerous encounters with Jehovah's Witnesses, and indeed some of them are on your YouTube channel. Is there anything unique about your encounters with this particular denomination? Mm. Well, yes, I have had a few conversations with JWs, not as many as I would have liked. Mm. Usually when I, when I run into a Christian, so, so what I first do is I just say, hey, can you, you, can you have some time to talk about a belief? And then you can even pick the belief. So it's conceivable that I've talked to a Jehovah's Witness who just brought up a completely different belief we've investigated. But OK, so um, I have talked to a few JWs and I've even had some come to my door. I don't know if I've ever told you the story or if you've heard the story, but uh, this was about two years ago. Some JWs came to my door, two two ladies, and we talked, and we talked for 45 minutes or an hour. And I was so excited when they showed up. And then uh, we ended on pretty good terms, and then I, I thought I'd never see them again. Well, the next week, four showed up. But I wasn't around. Four to at once. The door. I, yeah, four showed up. That that's very highly irregular by JW protocols for four people to show up at once. That's well, I wasn't there. My wife was there, and she said four showed up. So I'm taking her word for okay, it. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, and she said, "Hey, you know, Anthony's not home." <laughs> and I'm like, "That's okay. We'll come back." So well, the next weekend, six showed up. Good grief! The multiplying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And again, I wasn't there. <laughs> So my wife, I got a text from my wife saying, hey, you know, six people, <laughs> six JWs just showed up at the door. You need to tell them to stop coming. I'm like, I didn't even know that they were coming back. So what I'm thinking is that the conversation, and they never came back after that. Right. The conversation that I probably had with the two probably went, from my perspective, well. Like I think it probably, you asked earlier about goals, and I think maybe I forgot to, to address it. But yeah, my goals change, and my goals at the time were probably to – to help these two ladies think about the method they used to conclude that that belief is true and perhaps discover that it's not based – they didn't base it on anything reliable. They're believing it because possibly because of faith or maybe it's an appeal to an authority or perhaps there's, there's, some, there's some fear behind that or that they, they really think that there's evidence but there's not. I don't know. So – 
if they came back in, you know, double the amount later and even and then even more after that, that I think was probably a success because I think the conversation probably stayed with them. Mm. When I when I have a talk like I try to I really want to try to plant the seed so that people are thinking about it weeks, months, years later. And hopefully that happened with those folks. Um, I, I got to tell you, when, when, I, when I was talking to those two, and I've had other conversations with Jehovah's Witnesses, but they're usually, it's hardly ever just one. I, I think I've only had one conversations with one, one conversation with one Jehovah's Witness. Was that the one on the, ca- uh, it seemed to be like a campus. I saw a video of you speaking yeah. to a young lady. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think I actually, right now I'm thinking about it, there's another guy, James. Mm. Um, if you look for uh, a talk with my name with James in it, there's a real, it's just like six, six minute long video. The thing with JWs, and I don't know if they do this intentionally or not, I have to think that it probably is intentionally, but it seemed like when I was making really good progress with one of the two ladies, the other lady jumped in to redirect the conversation elsewhere. Hmm. It took it took the focus off of where we were going. Like when I'm when I'm talking to somebody using SE, I, it, I, I'm interested in their what, I'm interested in their why, but it's the method or the how. And we were down here, and then she hits me. Some other lady hits me up here with the, well, you know, let's talk about why blood transfusions are are not allowed. Like it, it was a distraction. So. The Jehovah's Witnesses might have a little bit of a leg up in terms of just the simple fact that when you talk with one, there's usually more standing around. Yeah. So I think if you know if you wanted to have a good conversation with somebody who is a Jehovah's Witness, I would suggest trying to make it a one-on-one if possible, where where you are minimizing the number of distractions. But when it comes down to it, whether you're Jehovah's Witness or you're you believe in uh, Islam, you know you're the Muslim. God or, or a Hindu God or whatever, or you just think God is love and it's the spiritual energy. I've talked to all different types of people. Uh, what, it, what the, the common denominator really seems to be that it's not all, it's not all based on anything testable, reliable, repeatable. And it seems to almost always come down to faith. That seems to be the epistemology that folks are using to conclude that their holy book is true or the miracle that they thought that they experienced was really their God. Mm. And that seems to be the common thing that pervades all these different types of beliefs. It, it seems to me that street epistemology is basically playing to the strength of atheism, which is that there is really no reason to be religious other than, as you say, faith. If you were to practice street epistemology on an atheist as a believer and say why do you believe what you believe or why do you not believe what you don't believe the answer would simply be I'm waiting for evidence and that's a great answer <laughs> but mm-hmm. you're not going to well, get you know, good... I, 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 I really have had conversation there I have a playlist on my YouTube channel called atheists and it's all it's where I've used se with people who are absolutely sure that there's no God Oh, so, so you mean like Gnostic atheists who say there is no God? Yes. Right, okay. They're, so if I ask them where they are in terms of their confidence that uh, in their belief that there is no God, they right. would say 100%. That's fascinating. And it is fascinating. Yeah. So I asked the, pretty much the same questions, and what we discover is that even the atheist cannot be 100% confident yeah. in their belief. Yeah. And that's the beauty of this approach, I think, is that it, it tends to move people off of these ledges of certainty yeah. more towards towards a little bit more openness and a little bit more understanding and a little bit more of an acknowledgement that I really can't be so sure that that's true. Yeah. Even though I'm an atheist and I, I read Christopher Hitchens and I love Dawkins, uh, I can't be 100% sure that there's no God. And that, that's a humbling discovery mm. when you have these talks. I'm really yes, glad that uh, you've so, done that. that that's fantastic. Because the thing is, I... I know that Gnostic atheists must exist. I just haven't encountered any yet. So for you to not only have encountered them, but to have practiced in a very honest way exactly the same process with them to highlight the fact that, again, this black and white thinking doesn't really hold up to scrutiny. I think that's really good. Yeah, right. And, and yeah, this is this is largely about encouraging people to be more open about their certainty 
as well as open to changing their mind if they discovered something. So, you know, th really thinking this through to say, what would I need to see or experience or discover that would move me up on my certainty that there is no God to a certainty that there was? And, and when you start asking yourselves these questions, I think it's a little bit easier to even relate to the people who do say that they're certain or highly certain that there is a God. Mm. I think it just helps us relate a little better to them. Indeed. Now, has anyone ever given you an answer to a question about their beliefs that has surprised you? Ah, yeah. Okay, so there was one time a guy, the main reason why he thought God was real is because he had a dream about it. His, his dog had just passed away, and he had a dream about the dead dog, and the, do the dog was talking to him and explaining to him all about heaven. And I honestly... I was really re – this was like a face-to-face -face conversation. I was inspecting his face and body language so closely because I thought, is he pulling one over on me here? <laughs> but he was serious. Wow. So, so sometimes the reasons that people give can be a little funny. But I'm really glad that I didn't laugh or ask him, you know, like, are you, are you pulling my leg? Because I think he probably would have been insulted by that. Yeah. So, so usually it's a little bit kind of surprising what people will say. And it becomes evident that they just haven't thought it through. But I think more, I'm more surprised at when I have these conversations at how open people tend to be when you engage with them using this approach. Even a complete stranger, I found, is that uh, – are you still there? Yeah, know? I'm still here. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Your video froze, so I don't know okay. if I lost you or not. Yeah. Um, it's amazing what people will disclose to you in a short amount of time, like very personal things. So they may say, I was molested when I was nine years old or something like that. Like, and I, I just met them seven minutes ago and they're, they're, they're revealing some very personal things. So that has been a little bit of a surprise. And also I think another surprise was discovering that just because a person lives in a secular country, like I was in Oslo about three months ago. Or it just because a person doesn't believe in a God doesn't mean that they've used a reliable process, a reliable foundation to build other beliefs. I've met atheists who think that they have a soul or think that, that karma is real, that there's some entity making sure that balance is happening. And, and that was a little bit of a surprise. Mm. I thought, oh my gosh, if somebody, has, if somebody has discarded a God belief, they've got to be these logical, rational creatures. And another discovery is that I myself – I'm not a perfect person when it comes to my belief formation processes. I'm, I'm fairly confident that I have a whole bunch of beliefs that are not true. And I'm, you know, I want to figure what, which, figure what those are so that I can stop believing those things. But those are probably been some of the bigger surprises, I would say, over the years of doing this. Fantastic. I, just um, to fill you in, I don't know how much you know about the, the process of evangelizing for Jehovah's Witnesses, but they actually report their time. So they, when you approach a witness, especially if they're all already engaged in the preaching, they are counting every minute that you're talking to them and actually literally writing down that figure on a piece of paper and handing it to one of their elders at the end of the month. So, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So in a way, in a, in a strange way, you're kind of doing them a favor by, because they will be in, filtering this whole experience as this is me preaching to him. He thinks he's asking me a bunch of questions, but actually I'm giving a witness. Ha <laughs> ha. Mm. Little does he know mm. sort of thing. And so that whole dynamic yeah. that you were describing earlier of, of someone else cutting in, that's probably where someone else has noticed that this isn't going the way we we want it to go and we need to steer it back onto because there's a, basically it's supposed to be a one-way flow of information they are supposed to be instructing you not you helping them understand how ridiculous their beliefs are so um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's what's going on when someone interjects <laughs> that's interesting yeah, yeah I, I didn't realize that they had a that they were actually keeping a tally yeah. And it makes me wonder, did the person jump in because they thought, okay, this lady, she's you know, Julie's had 20 minutes out now with this guy. I, I'm, I'm due for at least 15. Exactly. That's interesting. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, a little yeah. bit of insider knowledge there. 
Um, have the you know the, yeah go on. I was going to say there there has been some talk. Like when Goshen wrote his book. I think he even suggested at one point, or I don't know if he did this during a talk. There seems to be this under this idea that Jehovah's Witnesses are tougher to use this method with, and mm. that really hasn't been my experience, honestly. Other than the idea that uh, they might be pairing up and possibly distracting you from making progress, mm. I don't think that there are any. I don't think that they're, they're more difficult to the, deal with. Yeah, the the only thing I was um, wary of when I was approaching it because I I spoke to a guy called Dave again in Disneyland, and the only thing that I didn't want because this was actually being filmed for a documentary that I'm working on, I didn't want him misrepresenting his beliefs, because you do get that sometimes. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses have um, uh, what's called theocratic warfare, where they're allowed to lie if it's beneficial to the religion. And you do sometimes find a witness being very evasive to the point of outright lying, about what their beliefs are, if they think they can get away mm. with it. And with this guy, Dave, I was cornering him on, uh, it sounds quite aggressive that, but I just wanted to hear him say it. I wanted him to say, which is true, that Jehovah's Witnesses believe that every man, woman and child who isn't a Jehovah's Witness deserves to die at Armageddon, because that's what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. And it took me two or three attempts to hear him finally say it, because the first couple of times he kind of dodged the, the question a little bit. But the third yeah. time when I kind of cornered him on it a third and final time, he was like, yes, that's what we believe. Mm. And I think just having him say that, I, I like to think that he will have gone away and thought, crikey, you got me there, you know? Because, <laughs> because when you're a witness, that belief makes perfect sense. Well, everyone should die who disagrees with me, because then we can have an, a planet that's filled with righteous people. But it's not really a great selling point <laughs> when you're speaking to someone who you're trying yeah. to attract into the religion, <laughs> if that makes sense. We're going to leave that off the brochure. We'll, we'll, get, <laughs> we'll get that information later once people you know, get hooked on what we're selling. Yeah. Yeah, so, that, that, that could be tough. Hmm. That, so, that could be tough. Um, you, you kind of made me think of something that when we're having these talks using SE, we don't tend to, at least I personally don't have a, a goal like, all right, I'm not ending this conversation until he admits that he's basing right. his belief on faith or something. Yeah, yeah. I really do want to go where the person takes me. Mm. And what's interesting though, is that I'll have lots of conversations with people about God. And when you, when you have a thousand of these conversations and when you upload 300 of them and then people watch those 300, they tend to notice patterns. So in a way, it could almost look like we're navigating to some conclusion, but it seems like we're just going that way because those are really the only alternatives that these folks are basing these beliefs on. Mm. So I guess I'm, I'm raising this to just to, to make it clear to your audience that when you're having these talks, Give the person the benefit of the doubt that they really did base this belief on something that's true, mm. and they've based it on a solid foundation that's testable, mm. and start asking your questions. What I think you'll find is that they didn't, that it's 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 not based on a solid foundation, and therefore, the amount of confidence that they're putting in their belief is probably unwarranted. It's probably, it may very well even be an untrue belief. So yeah, um, the Dave Dave yeah, just, just to, to uh, okay. one of the. And this was, again, kind of what I expected. He went into, um, oh, well, I'm, I, when I was looking at Jehovah's Witnesses, I noticed that they were the only ones who were uh, not going to war. They were the only ones who were showing love and blah, blah, blah. And he kind of started <laughs> listing off these great attributes. So I said, well, what you're telling me sounds a lot like a box ticking exercise. So that if I can find a group that measures up to all of these different criteria... It must be worth following, but that doesn't tell me that it's God's one true religion because it could just be that you happen to meet a religion that meets all those criteria, but that alone doesn't make it God's one true organization on the earth. And mm. uh, yeah, it was interesting mm -hmm. to see how he kind of floundered a little bit at that point. But uh, was, the, was this a documentary or something that you're making? It, it was, but it was kind of like um, a test. So we ended up putting it on my channel. So 
viewers can watch it. It's mm. um, talking to Jehovah's Witnesses in Disneyland. It's on my channel. So by all means, check it out. Okay. Maybe uh, maybe it might. Because I'm certainly learning from you. Maybe you'll pick up something from that <laughs> as well. <laughs> I, hey, I'd love to. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I consume a lot of, of atheist content and all these different branches. And I love what you're doing, too. I've watched a few of your videos. And um, I don't even – it drives my wife crazy and my family. I don't listen to music much anymore unless my kids are in the car and they've hooked their phones up to, to the stereo. I don't listen to music. I listen to – content that's coming from the community mm. so there, there's a good chance that i that i'll probably stumble across that I'll, I'll seek it out fantastic yeah I, I, it's interesting i've gone down on music as well i used to be mad about music but for some reason i think you kind of pull your creative energy from the place where the music came <laughs> from almost i don't know so have there been any success stories of people contacting you because they have woken up from indoctrination as a result of street epistemology um, yes, I had about two dozen people who have approached me and after the fact, whether it was, you know, over email or I spotted them again or two years have passed and they decided to email me to say, you remember that conversation we had about everything happening for a reason and you asked me all those questions. Well, I'm not, remember I told you I was like a hundred percent sure I'm it's, it, I'm down to like, you know, like 40% now. I, I, I don't even, it doesn't even bother me. I don't think about it anymore. So I, that happens quite a bit. Uh, I have had people reach out to me that say, I was a Christian when we met. You asked me some great questions. I realized my, my, my epistemology was faith. I was using faith to conclude that this was true. I discovered that it was unreliable. And that conversation set me on a journey to figure out better reasons because I, don't want to, I didn't want to get rid of my belief in, in God. And they discovered that they didn't have any other reasons, and they ended up lowering their confidence and be, even becoming an atheist, and even asking where they can learn more about the questioning that I was using because they wanted to use it with their loved ones and their friends. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. So, so I, yes, I, and what's interesting also is that there are not just people that I've spoken to that are coming to me later. There are people who have watched my content, my videos, and there are other people uploading street epistemology content too, which is awesome. Mm. They are watching these videos. They are watching these folks answer poorly these questions that people using SE are asking. And then they're asking themselves the same questions and they can't, they can't answer them and they're lowering their confidence and they're, they're finding other communities that are out there to support them through that difficult time and other resources. And it's, it's a wild thing to get a message from somebody who is in Australia who has abandoned her belief because of your video that she watched. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a, becoming a frequent occurrence. I, I'm sure that you get, you get email from the people who watch your stuff. And it's motivating. It's motivating and it's, it's rewarding. And it seems to be a confirmation that what we're doing seems to be helping and it seems to be effective. It's crazy, isn't it? Because... <laughs> When I when I was a teenager, or even in my twenties, I couldn't have imagined doing what I'm doing now. Because apart from anything else, YouTube wasn't around then. But <laughs> nowadays, you can have yeah, you can have a conversation with someone uh, in the street and film it, and that can be seen by thousands of people, and it can have profound effects on people's lives. It, it's really quite astonishing to think about. It's it's fa it's fantastic, and it's great to even have shows like yourself to help us spread the word about this method, because I think the more people that understand this tool set of street epistemology, and they you know you can decide when to use it. I, I used it in an Uber a month ago when a guy said that he made some this outrageous claim, and I was able to use street epistemology gently question what he believed, and he ended up thinking about it, and maybe he even discarded his his ridiculous view on on. It was just crazy what he was thinking, but it, it's, it's, it is wild how the technology today has helped us reach these folks. Mm, indeed. In fact, you know, when, when I, after I read Bogosian's book, I started looking for video examples. YouTube was the first place that I went because I wanted to see people doing this. And I was like, okay, well, if this book is real, is, is legit and this, this technique works, where are the examples? And there weren't any at the time. And now there are literally thousands of video examples out there. Fantastic. Well, I should say there are literally 
there are probably literally more than a thousand video examples. <laughs> yeah, thank you for being correct. Or I would have had to use streets epistemology on you at that point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I would welcome you to do so. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if someone is watching this who is interested in starting out with street epistemology, what would your advice be? Oh, my advice for people who want to start using this mode. Well, nothing sells it more than watching an exchange. So even though you might be sitting and listening or watching this, this interview, please go out and watch a couple of my videos. I have a playlist of my top 10. Choose any one of those videos or choose anything that I've uploaded in the last two years. My early stuff is a little raw and probably not the best example. And I've slowly been making those unlisted. You oh, that's cheeky. There's a, You've got to there, keep the old there, stuff on. There, no, no, no. Let, let me clarify. There is a. I put them in a public folder called retired. So you can find the folder, but you can't easily find the video. But it's there. If It's not offline okay. or anything. Okay. Because I want people to see how bad I was when I first did this. Yeah. But if somebody is going to look for their first example of SE and they stumble across something that I did in 2012, no, not going to be good. So, so I, I try to be a little bit more careful as far as what videos people find first when they're looking at this. So yeah, watch a video or two. It doesn't have to be mine. There, 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 there's a good 12 people or so who are regularly uploading SE street epistemology videos. And then once you watch a video or two and you start to become interested in what's going on, my next advice I think would be to consider joining one of the Facebook groups that we have. If you search for street epistemology in Facebook, we have four groups out there. One is for atheists only. The other one is unlimited access to anybody it's called Learn Street Epistemology. And then there are a couple other ones. Uh, if you want to practice the method or if you want to critique the method, you can do so. And let's see, after that, probably buy Bogosian's book. If, if, if you prefer to you know, consume this by reading something, read the book that started it all. And uh, I even worked with Bogosian on making an app called Atheos, A-T-H-E-O-S. And you can put it on your Android or Apple device, and you can, you can practice the method without engaging a talk with a stranger or a loved one. And that's, that's fantastic. So you could just be sitting in your couch, on your phone, and you could be learning SE. So that would probably be a good way to start getting into it. And there's probably 13 other, 14 other things that are out there available for people who want to learn more about it. Fantastic. Have you considered yeah, writing, great. Have you considered writing your own book? I have considered it. And when I, when I, I, I'm not a writer for one thing, but I do feel like I've gained a certain amount of expertise in this area. And I see the benefit of it, and maybe 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 there would be something to writing a book. I just don't know if it's the best use of my time. Right. So I don't read a lot of books. I I don't even listen to music. I listen to podcasts and I watch videos. I don't consume a lot of books. I might listen to an audio book. I might maybe write a book. Um, Bogosian himself has been encouraging me to do something like that. So yeah. so maybe maybe one day I will. Uh, I I won't say that I. I, I won't do it. Have you have you written a book or anything? Are you thinking about doing that? Well, I've done a couple now. It's, so it's not if I can have do you? it. If I can do it, anyone can do it. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, maybe I will. I, I we'll see. I, I think there could be some some benefit to it. And I think I'm not. I wouldn't write one to make any money. I don't think I'd make a dime doing it. Mm. Maybe maybe literally a dime for every book you sell. But mm. I think it might open up doors to to getting more people to notice this method, like interview opportunities and that type of thing. So maybe there would be some benefit as to writing a book, but I don't, you know. Just just give it some thoughts. I'm not putting any pressure yeah. on you. <laughs> no, 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 I understand. I'm glad you asked it because I, I've really been kind of think, struggling with that question lately, and maybe that's why I'm taking more time than normal to answer that question because well, I'm, I really kind of, I want to know if I should write one or not. I'm, I'm, I really am wondering myself the, the coyness is duly noted and i'm sure we'll give lots of people hope that there might be a book in the pipeline in the future <laughs> um and finally as i ask nearly all of my guests do you have anything to plug mm. i'm in i'm working on a project with an illustrator who i met at qed con in manchester england about a Which year is ago. where i'm from you're from manchester yeah 
that brings things full circle, doesn't it? <laughs> hmm. Have you ever been to QED Con? No. Well, when I lived in Manchester, I was in a cult, so uh, that wasn't my okay. kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it kind of does bring it full circle. Well, I met an illustrator there, and we're in the process of working on two projects where we want to introduce these concepts to to children. There's no reason why children shouldn't be taught how to respectfully question deeply held beliefs. So we want to make these tools available to kids. So I think I think that's probably what I'm going to be working on in the next few months. I just finished a whole bunch of different talks and, and giving presentations on SE and even a lot of workshops the first half of this year. So honestly, for the rest of the year, I'm hoping that I don't have to, have to travel too much. Unless they invite me back to QEDCon, then I'd, I'd go there in a heartbeat. And then maybe the other thing I want to work on is uh, we're, we're trying to form – we want to form an organization of 501c3 for street epistemology because a lot of people will say, Anthony, I want to donate. How can I support what you're doing? How could we how could we study the effectiveness of this and see if it's hurting or harming? And uh, we need to form an organization. So that's that's on my list. And the other that maybe the one other thing is um, I want to keep building relationships with with organizations like Recovering from Religion which is a great resource, or the Secular Therapy Project. These are, these are organizations that are there to help people who used to be in a community where you used to believe in these things, and maybe you're still surrounded by a community that does believe in it. And it could be really hard. And when, because, because I think SE is effective, I think we have an obligation to direct people to resources if they need that. So I, when we do establish this organization for SE, I want to make sure that we have really good ties with these other organizations that are out there to catch people after they meet somebody who uses this approach. So, so that's also on my on my list mm. of things to do. So that's kind of one of uh, my. I find myself quite busy yeah. with this stuff. I, that's one of my regrets with my work is that um, you you put the information out there, and we discussed earlier how it kind of, you get the feedback and people whose lives have literally been changed by something that they've seen you do or, or they've seen some kind of video or, or conversation on the street. But it feels as though there's a desperate shortage of organisations and individuals who can give these people the aftercare that they need. Because we're talking about kind of almost like a flow of refugees from, in some cases, groups that have controlled almost every element of their lives. And then suddenly there they are in the big wide world, which they've looked throughout, throughout their whole life been taught to fear and be suspicious of and, you know, avoid at all costs. And it's a shame, really, that there, are, there isn't kind of a more clearly defined kind of catchment zone <laughs> where all these refugees can go to and, and get debriefed on what's happened. So the more work we yeah. can do in that direction will be fantastic. Yeah. The resources are out there. I think a lot of people aren't aware that they're there. So mm -hmm. I mentioned recovering from religion. I myself started a group. It's called Emerging Faith, and it's just a Facebook group. But we have, I think, almost 150 people in there. It's a secret group, too. So nobody would see that you're a member of it. Even if they went to your list and they looked at the groups that you've joined, they won't see it there. So people can send an email to emergingfaithhelp at gmail.com. And it's my understanding that there are – there's a few – Ex Jehovah's Witnesses resources that are out there for folks, and I hope people take advantage of that because the people that are that are part of those groups have been through it before, mm. and they they can really help you through those difficult times. And yeah. uh, you know the the fears that we might still struggle with, like the fear of hell, that that seems to be one that sticks that sticks with people for a long mm. time. And there's nothing you don't have to be ashamed by admitting that. Um, that's a that's a common thing that people go through. Indeed. No, there are resources, definitely. I'm, I'm think, I guess I'm thinking yeah. more in terms of therapy and, you know, like counselling, because that can be quite prohibitive, I think, when, you, when it comes to finding someone who's been trained with psychology and that kind of thing. But there are definitely resources available in terms of like, things like the, the, the XJW subreddit, for example, where people can go and, you know, share what's happened to them and, and get some kind of... Um, validation of, of of their experience but uh, I'm really really pleased to hear that you're kind of exploring that side of things as well and, and seeing what can be done 
Um, and I'm, I'm very grateful that you could come on the channel and talk about street epistemology. I, it's really been an honor to be on your show. Like I said, I've, I've seen your name around and I've watched a few of your videos and it's nice to be able to sit down and talk with you and, and make these connections because there may be somebody who reaches out to me tomorrow who says, I've watched your video, Anthony, and I don't believe it anymore. And I was a Jehovah's witness. What resources might you suggest? And, and, you know, having these connections can be useful. And I think it will be useful for people in your, in your, in your community, people who are watching this video, who want to have a better way to have a talk with their loved one, that uh, this might be a really good approach for you. I think it will really help things. Indeed. No, I'm very, very grateful for what you're doing, and it's a it's a brilliant approach. I can't recommend it enough. I will, of course, put a link to your YouTube channel um, in the description below. But, Anthony, it's been a pleasure having you and viewers. If you've enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to subscribe for more videos. And, as always, thank you for watching. <laughs>